So the main thing I want to talk about is why do we need inherited retina disease specialists? Okay, and why? So why am I? Why was I when I was recruited here 24 years ago? That that was one of the main things that, that was brought on. So why do we need them? So Chris, you're on the service now. So why? Uh, well, one reason is because uh, there's you know implications for future generations. So if someone has a disease, you want to know the likelihood of passing on your, your mm -hmm. kids is. That has potential for family planning and those sorts of things. Okay, so definitely planning. Another reason, so why does an academic center, where you know, we're supposed to be a top 10 center, why Why would you, every top 10 center have someone, should have someone? Well, they're, they're relatively rare. Many of them are quite rare. So like a general ophthalmologist, um, a practitioner wouldn't necessarily know much about them and know how to diagnose them. So it's helpful to have a referral center where mm -hmm. you refer to everything that's odd. And yeah, so you have to have someone who is somewhat knowledgeable. Any more reasons? There's actually quite a few. But. And another reason is that one, you know, a lot of people going into, say, comprehensive ophthalmology, I mean, they're doing that to see patients to do surgery, generate you know, all of that, and these patients don't generate that. So you need, you know, they want to have a referral center that they can send someone there, and so and to talk about, to talk with the patients. These patients, Take, as Chris will tell you on the service, take a lot of time. They, they have a lot of social issues. They have a lot. They need counseling. They'll bring in the whole family. They've they've been bounced around from specialist to special, or from ophthalmologist to ophthalmologist through all this process. And so they they need someone who will actually talk to them. And, it, and that can mean. And it's really it's a little bit more counseling. It's a little bit more oncology, psychiatry. A lot of different things. Now there's a lot of science and ophthalmology going on too. But you have to have someone who's willing to do that and to kind of and to and to work with these patients. And so there's for retina for inherited retina disease specialists, there's several different models. There's some if you go to some centers and we don't have this, that's all they do. You know, they see they see patient after patient with this. They run the ERG service, they run the genetic service, they run everything. You have to have a that's pretty specialized. There are some centers that do that, but not. But you have to have a lot of patients coming through, and it's also kind of hard for the retina specialist, for an inherited retina disease specialist, because you're going to see how many? You're going to see six, eight patients in a half day, maybe six. You know, they, they don't see a lot of patients, and these are you're you're giving a lot of bad news in, in general. So you don't want to do that all too much. You can also have models like mine where. I do retina, I know a fair amount about ret inherited retina disease, but it's not my only practice. And so and I've learned through the years that you have to control your practice with that. And so when you come onto the retina service, you'll see I have, if, if they actually followed my schedule, I have one, in, one new inherited retina disease spot per half clinic, basically. And it's because unlike you know, a, a quick new retina patient you can see in five or ten minutes, I really need a half hour or so of my, it'll end up eating up a half hour of my time. They're here for a huge number of testing, which we'll talk about, a huge amount of testing coming through. And it blocks up the clinic if you, if you get three inherited retina, new inherited retina disease patients in a row, it's just going to destroy the flow of your clinic. And it's, so I try to do that, now they're always sneaking in patients so that Either they're misdiagnosed, or there's some, you know, there's some, there's always some excuse why I end up with two or three in my clinic, and it's just, and you just have to deal with that. The and the so, and then the other thing that I kind of insisted through all this, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, is that I needed help just in seeing the patients and in follow up, and by having someone, by having a genetic counselor, you know, it was. And she's really a good resource if you have any projects that you want to do. She really knows her stuff. She's got a good database for all these patients. But I needed someone who I could say, well, I, when I talk to the patients and say, you need genetic testing, we were going to do the, the new tests here. I needed someone who can actually get proper consent, can kind of go through in detail, answer their questions, and then even more importantly, do the follow-up. Because you order these tests, you draw the blood, and they may, the results may not come back. Now, I, well, they'll come back within two or three months. It'll take a little, you know, but they're not going to come back right away. But someone has to track all these. If you talk about 10, 15 years ago, 
I'd order genetic testing and say, well, especially with iGene, sometimes they'd never ever come back. The results would, you know, they just, or they'd come back three years later and you'd have to do follow up. And so that, that didn't work on that. So having a genetic counselor is very important. The, the other things to have a, for a retina disease specialist is they, these patients are very interesting and the biochemistry and the pathology that you'll see and that we'll talk about today is very interesting and through the, the last couple decades we've really learned a lot about the basic biochemistry. We can start to think about interventions we, and genetic testing has changed dramatically from as I said before no genetic testing and <coughs> genetic testing in a couple to research based genetic testing to genetic testing whenever it comes back to, yes, we'll get something back and there's a more than 50% likelihood we'll know exactly what's going on. And then you have to, of course, discuss why we're doing this. And then finally, the with clinical trials, we do have clinical trials there, and I'll talk a little bit about what is coming up for some of these diseases. The problem is, as, is that there are too many, too many genes, there's too many targets now for what we're doing. Okay, so does that make sense in terms of why? And then, of course, you have to learn some of this stuff for the boards, and you'll just, you'll see, I'll flash some pictures, of course, in your, in your, um, your books, you just have to learn. There's some things, I'll highlight a few diseases that do show up on the boards and some that never will, and it doesn't always correlate with what you'll ever see. I'm gonna talk about diseases that I have never seen in my life. You know, these patients have never shown up, but they're so characteristic and they were so described so many decades ago that they are, that they're expected that you know them, okay? So, um, the retinal dystrophies that I see coming through my clinic vary, you know, are, are quite, raw, quite wide through all this. So you've got, the classic one is gonna be retinitis <coughs> pigmentosa, which is shown here as a, as a kind of classic slide here. You're gonna see syndromic patients in my clinic, not not an enormous amount, but you'll see some, and, that, and these syndromic ones basically mean that there's, that the mutations that are causing these problems not only affect the eye, but cause other problems elsewhere in the body. And of course, with, uh, with one of the reasons why, why there's so much genetics known about this is that there are syndromic cases, but I'd say the vast majority of the, of the, of the cases we're going to see are isolated to the eye. So. These are healthy people that have lived long enough to have kids and keep passing these genes through various generations. So you still see them. We can study them in exquisite detail because usually they're, they're, there's something unique about these genetic defects that are targeting the eye. And we need to understand why and we can try to figure these out and treat them. And if you can, if we can get things under control in these patients, and I'd say it's still very rare, then you know, they can have otherwise good lives. So you have to, you know, you, this is something that's a good target to try to, to try to improve their lives. And then, as I think Nico has presented in one or in a previous uh, Grand Rounds, some of these are stationary retinopathies. And so what stationary means, they look bad, they have some visual defects, but they aren't gonna get worse. That's the problem with a, a, most of the patients that we see with inherited, especially inherited retinopathies. These are not gonna get better, they're gonna get worse, and you're trying to counsel them. But there are some that truly will never get worse. And I've caught several patients over the last, last few years, young kids, you know, teenagers, that have been identified as having inherited retina diseases and thought that, and misdiagnosed as retinitis pigmentosa, and they're learning braille, they're doing cane training, they're going through all this stuff and told them that they can't do things, and then they turn out to have a stationary retinopathy that's not going to get worse. And I can definitively tell them that genetically and say, just get on with your life. If, you, if you're doing okay the way you are, and most of these teenagers say, yeah, I can't, you know, I have some problems, but not that much. <clears throat> and you know, don't, don't be worrying about going totally blind. Um, then, of course, we have other, other diseases, cone dystrophies that are going to be more affecting the macula than the, than the uh, peripheral retina. You also want to pick up any toxic retinopathies. There are a few out there. We'll talk a little bit about those. And then, of course, pseudoretinopathies, which aren't even retinitis pigmentosa. They're old and burnt out inflammatory diseases or other things. So 
the, when you see in my, in my clinic, you're gonna see patients always coming through with retinitis pigmentosa. And the, the estimated prevalence is really pretty good at one in, one in 3,000. So if you think about there's 300 million people in the United States, there's 100,000 people with this disease, okay? Now, that makes this an orphan disease, and why is it an orphan disease? Well, do you know the definition of what an orphan disease is? I think, I think I'd still know it. I think it means that there are 200,000 people or less in the United States with the disease. And that, that's an important thing because, an important designation, because uh, for the FDA and drug companies, there's a lot of incentives for, to develop diseases for orphan diseases. They get fast tracked, they get all sorts of uh, monetary incentives if they're first to market. And probably, and, I, and retinitis pigmentosa was probably, very vocal community, and I think they were part of the part of getting this established in the federal government to do it this way. And that's probably where the number 200,000 came from, because if they put it at 100,000, people would be arguing, well, is RP an orphan disease or not? But if you set the number at 200,000, then retinitis pigmentosa is, um, it fits into the category. Now, with RP, as we'll learn, is it's, an, it's very common it starts out, patients, when they're younger in classic RP, have pretty good vision, you know, when they're in teenage years and their young adult years. But as time goes on and the vision constricts, eventually they will go to legal blindness and become, you know, become, have big problems. But that's very compatible with that time course of classic RP, that you can be very successful in, in industry, you know, be a captain of industry, be, make a lot of money, and then eventually you run into big problems. And so when I deal with people, at the, uh, when I talk with people at the Retinitis Pigmentosa Foundation, some of them, a surprising number of them are billionaires you know, that have had, um, that have made it through, you know, done very well in business, and now are going totally blind. And they, they have, you know, through the years, if they're billionaires, they've learned that in business, money solves everything. In medical research, it doesn't solve everything, of course, but they, so they're an interesting kind of cohort to deal with. These, uh, they have a lot of very high expectations, often over expectations, and they, but they are, on the other hand, willing to fund a lot of research for this. The, there's a large variety of inheritances. The clinical course and genetic causes are diverse. We'll call it, cover that in the next slides. And unfortunately, the, there's only limited uh, clinical interventions. So the next slide I won't put up yet, but what is, if someone with RP, what are the classic symptoms that they're gonna have? Okay, what are, what are the chief complaints the patients are gonna come in with? Poor night vision. Okay, poor night vision is almost always the first thing though. If you take the history, they say, when I was a kid, I didn't see as well as, as anyone else. So that's correct. Anything, what next? I mean, if it's more advanced, you're gonna get like decreased visual acuity as well with some peripheral field changes. Yep. So you get like the ring scotoma. Right, so even, so the acuity is often late in classic RP. That stays pretty good. They can still read. But yes, they will start noticing constriction of their visual field. Okay. They have like CME. Right, so CME, and that's important. We'll see that in the next slide, that uh, CME is important because that's potentially treatable. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, that's correct. And you know, eventually, if they have it long enough, they'll have no light perception, other problems. The, so those are, are truly, those are the main things that you're gonna see. Progressive visual field loss syndrome. Exactly what we said right here. That's gonna be the main things that they, that they talk about. And the, um, they may have a family history, so they may know about it, they may not. They may be able to do, you know, function pretty well. Some people can be, and, the onset, I didn't hear age, and that's, you know, there's classic ages, but there's a huge diversity in, in RP. There's some, you know, well, there's some where the kids are debilitated in their, you know, when they're five years old, but I, I, I diagnose RP, you know, not infrequently in patients who are 70, 80 years old, or who are doing, functioning pretty well, have got, gotten, again, high, very high level jobs, but are now starting, the, vis the visual field starting to constrict in and they're starting to have problems. So 
one of the ones that probably the more one of the more disturbing ones that I diagnosed was someone who came in who was a commercial airline pilot okay and so he made it through and you'll see this even at the VA you know how did these patients get in to be become soldiers you know they, they look at their eyes and with the commercial airline pilot what, what do you think his chief complaint was when he came in finally? Peripheral field vision? Yeah, but in w doing what function? Do you need a lot of peripheral vision to fly a plane? Probably not. Driving, yeah. yeah. Driving, even that didn't bother him so much. But yeah, for when you fly a plane, you're looking straight ahead, you got the gauges, they're all really bright, they're all close to you. And you don't even look to the right or the left, you're looking straight ahead and you've got all this. So his hardest thing to do was walking through the airport terminal. Okay, when you go through the airport terminal, people are coming in, darting in front of you from the right and left, crossing there. And he was bumping into people while trying to get to the plane. And that, that did not inspire a lot of confidence. <laughs> and his field was bad enough that I said, you can't, you know, there is no way that your employer will be happy about you flying. So, but he made it a long time. He was in his 50s by this time. And you know, I was surprising he didn't seem to have any problems flying a plane at night either. So. Anyway, it's all about the pilot, right? Yeah, a it's lot of it is. A lot of it's automated, but I think he, you know, he had learned. Anyway, okay. So that's those are the symptoms. Now, what are the signs? What are you when you look in on these patients? And occasionally they have no symptoms at all, right? So what do you see that's going to tell you? I think this is RP. What are the classic signs? Okay, bone spicules are classic. Yes. What else? Like arterial attenuation and optic nerve, like a waxy pallor look. Yep. Those are all the classic descriptions, yes. Um, sometimes there's vitreous cells, just debris that's floating around in the eye. What about an anterior segment? Anything that you might, that is common, not going to be diagnostic? Keratoconus? Mm, rare, rare. PSC? PSC cataracts are common, and we don't know why they get that, but they do get cataracts. Anything else? We already mentioned CME. So I think we got most of them. Yeah, we'll see. Bone spicules, peripheral retinal atrophy, just in general. You're going to have waxy pallor of the optic nerve, attenuated vessels, vitreous cells, both PSC. So you got most of them there, right there. And the, the macula is relatively preserved. So that's, but this is again classic. And you're going to see, but not all these patients present classically. And there are going to be all sorts of exceptions. And then you've got the patient, so they've been referred in from the outside, and what, um, what diagnostic tests are you gonna do? And this is where, again, I run my clinic, and Chris will know all this, so I've got kind of a standard protocol that the patient, if they come in in an inherited retina disease spot, they have a bunch of testing before I've even seen them. And, can, and that's another reason why I don't wanna have too many patients, because this is almost as bad as neuro. It's a couple hours of testing <laughs> that, that they have to go through before they even see me. So if they, I, and so I'm not, I don't want to have too many. They got that's my my inherited retina disease new patient slot is always early. So what do you, what are, what are they going to have done? Isn't that an OCT? Oh, they'll they'll always have an OCT. Why are you getting an OCT? Well, they may have CME. We want to know that. Two, you could actually see some of the atrophy, and we'll talk. And what else? So OCT, everyone gets an OCT. ERG. ERG, they'll be scheduled for that. Um, I like getting an ERG, just it's diagnostic. It can't, it unfortunately goes bad early in the disease, so it isn't always good for following them. But I like to have patients to, if they're truly coming in with RP or similar conditions, you wanna, be, you wanna do at least a baseline ERG if you can get them to do it. So that's, they'll be scheduled for an ERG, that's correct. What else? Visual field is very important. And what kind of visual field do I order? Glaucoma. Gold gold yeah. The, because the standard visual fields that you see in glaucoma are only going out 30 degrees. And we need to, I need to know the whole field, you know, going out, way out. So visual fields are very important. Autofluorescence. Autofluorescence. Let me just step back with the visual field. So the gold mine, we do have automated octopus visual fields that are wide field to the octopus 900. The problem with that is it takes forever to do, and the techs hate it, the patients hate it. It's actually probably faster to do a Goldman manually to do it. The other reason that I do a Goldman is it's required for driving, and especially when you get teenagers or even adults, they have to get recertified for their driving. And if they don't have it done 
then as it was, and they and they need to have it done binocularly at least with the three four e. That's what I need to know for driving. And so I really am very insistent, and they still disregard me. I'd say twenty percent of the time, and don't give me a, a binocular, and I send it back. The other thing that just in personally the way that I do visual fields is there's so much worry about flow in my clinic to get these patients through that I don't care if they're dilated or not. I know you're taught do visual fields when they're undilated, but for my clinic and for following these patients, I don't really care. And I try to emphasize that just to get the visual field in and get it done. I'm willing to, to, to say when, they say when they're backed up, because otherwise they'll wait and sit there undilated for two hours waiting for the Goldman field. And I'd rather have some other test done, the, the autofluorescence, the color photos, all the other things. So autofluorescence, yes, and that has to do somewhat a little bit more research than clinical, than clinical management, but it, is, it can be a way to follow the disease. So the autofluorescence is true. I'll get a FLEO just because we can do that and we're following, following them. Um, I'll get a macular pigment just because, again, it's a research tool, but, and it can be useful for future studies that, that I'm doing. It also gives you some idea of the, of the health of the retina because, it, especially in classic RP, the macular pigment is actually preserved pretty well. Um, okay, so what else? Any other tests that you'd want? I think that's most of it. Okay. And that's, so they're going to have all this battery of what I call non-invasive testing to, uh, coming through. Um, they will, and then when they, my technicians should be uh, at least getting a clinical history, how long have they had this, what is the family history is very important. They uh, need to have a dilated retina examination and photography, and they also are going to get color vision is very, uh, tends to get forgotten in my clinic, but is important to have. The electroretinography I often save until after I've seen them, just because it takes so much time to, to get that arranged. OCT. And then in the end, uh, my, ge my genetic counselor will meet with them. Or if she's not available, we at least draw the blood and say that they will, they will be coming through. So that's, that's enough to keep, keep a patient busy through an entire half-day clinic. That's, that's plenty right there. And of all these uh, things that we do, I think the visual field testing is the most important for following patients. And so this, uh, let's see if I can so you can see this, this graph is just showing how a visual field can progress from 20 years to 50 years you know, to just a tiny visual field. But potentially this patient, at least at 40 or 50, was, could have been potentially 2020 still here and still able to read, but not able to function without, without the visual field. And then with that visual field in terms of mobility. And then, of course, They'll get a, an electroretinogram, and Don Creel is much more of an expert than I, than I would ever be. But you know, we're looking at, unfortunately, with RP, they'll have just a flat, a flat scotopic ERG. The cone flicker will be attenuated and uh, delayed and various other things. And you can distinguish it between cone dystrophies. Stationary night blindness is, of course, very important to distinguish because that is stationary and all that. So, but I. I get, we get that. And then, uh, then we work on the genetics. And the genetics of RP comes in all different flavors. That's the, that's the challenge with this disease. So you've got dominant, recessive, X-linked, mitochondrial. Everything has been described. And so I, I don't have time to draw a whole genetic tree like this. My genetic count, uh, Emily will, and will give some, you know, and so you can figure out this one clearly is uh, these are examples of dominant disease here. And so dominant is fairly common. About 20, 30 percent of patients will come in with autosomal dominant uh, disease. And it's, uh, it's uh, important to know that dominant is one of the more mild forms of RP. And so usually they, that, and that can make some of the, the genetics a little bit challenging because occasionally you know it's dominant and someone is an obligate person who should have the, because they have children with the disease, they have parents and siblings with the disease, and they say, I do just fine. And that's sometimes because they truly are fine, but usually they just have such mild disease that they've adapted and don't seem to have any problems. So it's a later onset, milder, variable penetrance, 
And commonly, the, and the reason why this is important, is the first gene for RP was rhodopsin, you know, found in the 1990s. And so, and that makes sense. It's, it's a unique photoreceptor specific protein. It's dominant in some way. It's not clear why it should be dominant, but the reason why it's dominant is often some of these compounds, or some of these mutations cause misfolding of the protein. And with misfolding, they then, uh, they st then start accumulating abnormally in the cell and eventually the cell dies. So that's, that's the one that we see the most. We got very excited when this first happened that we were gonna figure out you know, that, every, that this was going to be the major gene and we could treat this. And the problem is it's only, it's one of only many, many different genes. And we know that dominant can also be RDS peripherin, and we see that quite a bit, which is another structural protein in the, in the, in the cell. And the important thing about RDS peripherin is that it can look like anything. It can look like classic RP, it can look like macular dystrophies, it can look like pattern dystrophies. So it's a little more complicated, but it's reasonably common. And then a number of them are ciliopathies that have to do with the cilium structure of the photoreceptors. They can be RNA splicing factors, which doesn't, is not totally obvious why RNA splicing factors, which are found in every cell in the body, but if you have a defect in this, only the eye is affected. And basically it says that there's no backups in the eye. The, the photoreceptor is such a specialized, uh, specialized cell that it doesn't have backups that a, normal, that a regular cell would have that can take the place of the defective protein. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of protein misfolding and misdirection. Recessive is the next one. It's, I would consider it relatively uncommon here in Utah, at least, and that's because we don't have a lot of, despite our reputation, we still are not a consanguinous population here in Utah with the Mormon population. They're, not, they're diverse enough. And, but in cultures where, where they are, where First cousins are marrying a lot, or when I was in South India last year, where a very desirable marriage to keep the money within the family was to have a niece marry her uh, maternal uncle. It's just way too close, and you get a lot of, you get a lot of uh, unusual, rare autosomal recessive uh, diseases. And they are often severe early onset, and the ones in the consanguineous population are gonna be primarily um, you know, are going to be homozygous mutations. What I see here in Utah on these recessive diseases is they're compound heterozygotes. So they have mutations in the same gene, but different mutations. So the parents are not related. Um, one of the more common ones that we see is labor's congenital amaurosis, but you're going to see that in the pediatric clinic. They are severe, early onset, and many of these are going to be mutations that are enzymatic, somewhere in the visual cycle. And the classic one for Labor's congenital amaurosis is RPE65, and why is that important? Well, we actually have a treatment. Yeah, we have a treatment, you know, it is. The problem is, as you can see, you know, they picked a disease that's just plain too rare. Okay. I, I have, I do genetic testing on all my patients. I have exactly two patients with RPE65 mutations, and both of them are in their 50s now totally burned out, so they, they would not benefit from the uh, million dollars of gene therapy. So you want to catch them when they're very young, but in our population, is, there's just not enough here. And so even though they're charging $420,000 an eye, the company's never going to make its investment back you know, on this, you know, even at that price, because they just picked something that's, uh, that's too rare. But, um, and it may be diagenic, but you know these patients, are severe. The, the, patient, the two patients I have, say, with RPE65 mutations, one I saw recently, and he is literally the first patient I saw when I started practice here 24 years ago. And he, you know, he was 20 years old then, you know, could read a little bit then, got himself into law school, became a lawyer, is still practicing as a lawyer with, with essentially light perception vision. So he's intelligent, functioning as best he can, the other one is an Iraqi refugee who's you know, definitely from a consanguineous family and had, you know, was just too far along, but, she, but had several siblings that were affected. Then you're going to have X-linked RP, and so that means males are generally going to be carriers, are going to be affected, females are carriers. This can be severe, um, and they, but it, 
or they can be late onset. You know, there's a lot of different ones. The one that's shown here, if you see this on the boards, what's the answer for what this is? Yeah, that's choroideremia. And you need to, the reason you see this is you can see that the, it doesn't look like classic RP, does it? Right? You, just, you can see the choroidal vessels, there's severe atrophy, and they'll have kind of clumped pigmentation, round clumps of pigment rather than bone spicules. So it's a little, it looks different. Um, they can also be due to RPGR, and that's more, that gives you a more classic RP. These are important, one, because they're fairly common, two, because they are X-linked, they often come in with a whole family history that's known, and so the family knows. Not only do you know if you diagnose someone with this disease, uh, but they know, they know that their uncle or whoever, you know, they know what the natural history is in the family, and they're worried that they're going to get, you know, that at that age 50, they're going to be uh, severely blind too. And the other thing that's important is this is the next, the next frontier of gene therapy. A lot of them, we are part of the natural history studies for both choroideremia and X-linked RP, where we're bringing patients in, you'll see them in my clinic, they come in every six months, which is way too often for an inherited retina disease patient. But for a clinical study, we bring them in every six months, this is, the drug companies are flying these patients in from all across the country just to see me at our site. So I get patients that are flying in every six months from Hawaii, from Indiana, every, they're all, it's kind of, it's kind of unusual, but that's the way that it works on this. And their goal is to have gene therapy because these are single gene mutations typically that, again, gene replacement may be useful for. And the choroideremia should be starting by next summer think for gene therapy and unlike classic gene therapy where you have to do a fairly invasive subretinal injection the um, the vector for choroideremia is being designed uh, to be intravitreally uh, administered and to penetrate through the retina they've genetically selected for it at least they claim and we're going to be one of two phase one sites so we're going to be truly the, the first doing these uh, these intravitreal studies so that's, that's another reason why you'll see a fair number of these patients in my clinic. Then there's uncommon or mitochondrial diseases. Those you may see in, uh, in neuro more often than in mind. They, they're often associated with neurologic disease. They're going to have a maternal in inheritance. They're going to be rarer syndromic things like uh, Kern-Sayer, Milos, and other diseases like that. And then that leads into syndromic RP. And so what's, well, what is this disease here? If you, again, if you see this on the boards and they just have a picture like that, what are, what are they getting at? What's wrong with this patient first? Extra toes. What? Extra toes, yes. Extra fingers and toes. So what, what is the answer? What RP syndrome gives you extra fingers and toes? Beetle. Yeah, Bardet beetle. So it's shown right there. That one will show up. Okay, and again, it's trigenic. We know the genes. What else in Bardet beetle? What else do they have? In the, uh, don't they tend to be? Uh, are they big, like heavier yep. set? They're yeah. obese. They're not very bright. They uh, they have hearing loss, and it's it's interesting. I once. A year or two ago, I guess two years ago now, I was invited. To, they had a Bardet Beetle convention here in Utah, and it was there. It's a, seeing a whole room full of them is very interesting. In there. Uh, but so they can have that. Other one, other syndromic ones that you need to know about are Usher syndrome, of course, right? So what's Usher syndrome? What is that by definition? It's RP and they can't hear. Right. So RP and hearing loss. It's autosomal dominant almost almost always, or I mean, sorry, recessive. It's recessive, and there's different types, but that's another one where gene therapy is coming soon. They know it's a big gene, but people are working on that. Senior locum is rarer, but um, anyone know about that? Who's written the, the definitive review on senior locum? Nico did. Nico did, right. Nico did his PhD on senior locum syndrome. <laughs> To know that Aperts is rare, Goldman Fav is rare. I've written a paper on Refsum disease. I've never seen it in, in a mouse, in a adult, in cell culture models. 
I've never ever seen Refsum disease in my life yet, but I got a paper out of that. But what's important about Refsum and gyrate atrophy is that they're very, um, they were described long ago, we knew the genetics long ago, and they are treatable with diet. That's the thing, so that was uh, gyrate atrophy, you go on it, uh, it's a defect in ornithine aminotransferase, so you go on a low ornithine diet, Refsum disease is phytanic acid, you have to avoid phytanic acid in the diet. So that, that's why those, those are known. Then, of course, there's plenty of them that are sporadic. No history at all, you're gonna find. That's, that might mean because there's a new mutation in the person. Might be that it's just recessive and well, they're the only one in the family. Uh, but they also might be a pseudo-retinitis pigmentosa. It might be autoimmune. You gotta think about other things that are going on that might be treatable. So it could be, you'll hear probably from the uveitis people about cancer-associated and uh, melanoma-associated retinopathy. We get uh, gene, gene, uh, gene or anti-retinal anti antibody testing. But you also have to remember, we talked about toxic etiologies. So I have picked up toxic uh, retinopathies. And so the, the one paper that I published long ago, more than 20 years ago, a patient came in with a funny-looking retinopathy. Uh, they, Dr. Degree had done a, just a kind of history, and he was just noted when he was referred to me that he had exposure to MS-222, which he probably never ever heard of. But in my PhD thesis, I had worked on this compound, which is a toxic compound in animals that cause, that's a fish anesthetic that causes, problem, that causes ERG abnormalities in fish. This patient happened to be a fish pathologist, and what he did is when he threw the fish in the MS-222 for them to go to sleep, and then he would reach in with his arm and grab the fish out and was getting it all over his arm and basically was exposing himself to this toxin. And we basically, we told him, wear some gloves, for God's sakes. And so, and he did, and he got better, and that was it. And so, that's, that's a possibility. And then uh, the other thing that you will see occasionally in my clinic is vitamin A uh, deficiency. So, uh, what causes vitamin A deficiency in the, develop in the, in the United States? Number right. one cause, probably. Right. Right, bariatric surgery, and those patients are out there, and they may have had it 20 or 30 years ago because it takes forever to make yourself vitamin A deficient, but you gotta catch these patients, and they are, um, Don, Don Creel is pretty good at picking them up by ERG, and you just, if you take a little bit of a history and find out you know, if they've had this bariatric surgery, get a vitamin A level. The patients are eternally grateful, and I've cured several patients by this, by just, Either giving them, you know, high doses of oral vitamin A to get past their, their, um, their deficient uptake, or by giving them injectable forms, which unfortunately are very expensive, but you can cure them again. So a rare comp patient that I've seen is someone who just was such a picky eater that he did not eat any fruits or vegetables at all ever, and gave himself vitamin A deficiency, and he, he came in with classic. He couldn't see at night. He had to get. He had to wear, use a flashlight to get around his house. And when I took his dietary history of fruits and vegetables, he basically says, I, eat, I sometimes eat a banana every few weeks. That was it. And that was done, you know, in terms of what he ate. And his wife confirmed that, yes, he only eats meat and potatoes. That's it. So, and once he started taking, changing his diet, I never saw him again, except we, we called him up and he said he's doing fine. Too busy to come back in. So, um, and then there, as we talked about stationary retinopathies, they don't have clinical progression. They often have very prominent night, night blindness, but the visual field is good. Other things you wanna look at are, that is, are these congenital stationary night blindnesses, and there are certain mutations that just don't cause a lot of problems. RDH5 can, can give you all of these spots. Retinitis fundus albipunctatus right here. And that can just be a problem. You know that if you can diagnose them with this, then they don't need to worry so much. And then in terms of treatments, basically you want to do social supports. Um, so you know they they have problems in school. They maybe have problems with jobs. That's why we have social work staff. Uh, you want to do genetic counseling. That and our we have that under control now. Nutritional interventions rare but are important to have. They'll ask about lutein and zeaxanthin. I say it's 
not bad to take it, but that's not going to really cure them. Um, gene therapy is coming, you know, is here in, for Luxterna. More of them will be coming, but they're going to be research-based. Stem cells, patients read up on the internet. There's a lot of promises, but there's no good stem cell studies that have been done yet that have really cured patients that, you know, that are FDA approved uh, and, or even FDA san you know, sanctioned for clinical trials. So that's still coming, but I obviously tell patients that, you know, five or ten years is a long time. You know, there, a lot of things can happen in, uh, in technology in five to ten years. And then people are, we're looking at various other more generalizable interventions, either oral or injectable growth factors, antioxidants, uh, valproic acid, we were part of the studies here where, you know, there, there's always a lot of promise on these preclinical, people may give antioxidants or some other intervention to a mouse, they get better and they say, well, let's give it to humans, they'll do it if they're on, if the, if the drug is available, they'll give it, some patients may see a little bit better or not, but, and that happened with valproic acid, there was a lot of buzz and people started because it was already on the market, people started taking, uh, started prescribing it to their RP patients. But it wasn't until the Foundation Fighting Blindness stepped in and invested millions, of, about probably $8 million to do a proper clinical trial that it didn't work. We were part of that trial and then it's kind of faded away. So you gotta be careful about false hope and all these things you'll see on the internet for electrostimulation, stimul other things that just are taking people's money away. Um, and then artificial vision with the Argus II implant was a great tour de force that they could make an a chip implant that got them a little bit of vision. The problem is that the intervention cost $100,000 and the, the quality of vision was still so poor that it didn't have a great patient acceptance and insurers balked at it. So the next step is going to be to do cortical implants. So the company, Argus, the Argus II implant, even as we were gearing up to start implanting it, was pulled off the market. In two weeks or so, Mark Humayan, who's the one who's the father of the, of the Argus II implant, will be giving a talk here on a Tuesday afternoon at 4 o'clock. I think you should go if you can, if you can get away. And that's the Benning. He's a very good lecturer. So, okay. And then I'm going to go through other things just so we a, a little bit faster now on this. And so other things that I'll see are cone dystrophies. They have a wide range of manifestations. The most common cone dystrophy is color vision deficiency. That's in 3 to 5% of males have that. Um, they can have macular cone dystrophies, progressive cone dystrophies. Achromatopsia is the most severe. That's, that's less common. And they, of course, will have loss of color vision, loss of central visual acuity. Very uh, characteristically, they'll have photophobia, much more than a classic RP patient would. And their visual field is often really pretty good. Um, but they may have bullseye maculopathies. And the way that we diagnose cone dystrophies, almost the same as RP. So you can do clinical history, family history, dilated examination, all the same things that that are doing that we're doing. They just have to, have, but they're going to come. They're going to have different findings. They're going to have a preserved visual field. They're going to have macular problems much more. Genetic testing will distinguish that. And so cone dystrophy, it's the same. Genetic counseling, maybe stem cells, maybe gene therapy. And of course, remember that there can be ocular toxicity. Numerous uh, agents can mimic retinal, uh, retinal dystrophies. These include the tamoxifen, uh, this is canthoxanthin, where you get these crystals depositing in there. The um, other things, we look at Plaquenil, which can give you a macular dystrophy here, and uh, tobacco, alcohol, ethabutol, all of the other, other things. Other toxicities that we've picked up here in clinic are chromium, uh, chromium cadmium toxicity, and why would someone come in with that? Anyone know that one? There was a small outbreak a few years ago. It had to do with hip, imp bad hip implants that were that were sending uh, that were leaking out all the ions in there, and that that caused a pretty bad macul um, ocular problems too. And then there are other ones, you know, digitalis, uh, the 
Um, Viagra can cause transient color vision problems, and then there's other, other ones there. And then finally, uh, remember pseudoretinopathies. These can be post-inflammatory, after trauma, idiopathic. And the main thing, one of the more, and also think about uh, rubella retinopathy can often get misdiagnosed. All these are stationary, and you don't need to uh, you don't need to work them up as as a normal uh, as a regular retinal dystrophy. And typically, sometimes they have good electrophysiology. I can talk briefly. About, either we can stop, or I'll talk briefly about macular dystrophies. In macular dystrophies, you're going to see the things that you need to think about are Stargardt disease. That's going to be common. Um, that's about a 1 in 10,000 disease, so it's not as common as RP, but it's plenty common out there. Best disease, and then various other ones listed here. And I'm just, just to, we'll talk briefly about those. So Stargardt disease, 1 in 10,000, so 25,000 to 30,000 people infected in the U.S. It's 95% autosomal recessive. But there are dominant forms too, and there's thought that you know that because it's involved in uh, deposits of lipofusin that there may be some increased risk of AMD, but it's not a major AMD gene, unfortunately, um, because but because it would make things easier in the diagnosis. The Stargardt disease normally they have normal completely normal vision at birth when, when they're young. They decline in central vision typically in their teenage years, but there's really wide variation. Classically, they'll have macular atrophy uh, described as metal, and they have these pisiform flecks going around. So, but not all Stargardt disease looks like this. Not everyone. We've learned there's a huge diversity in this. You'll see in my clinic, I have diagnosed people 60 or 70 years old with Stargardt disease that are still, you know, that are functioning still pretty well because if it doesn't knock out their central vision, they may not notice much change. On the other hand, they could be debilitated at age seven also. Uh, the end stage typically just stops at 2400 vision and there's preserved central vision. So you can see the flex right here, you can see the atrophy here. Um, the way that we diagnose Stargardt disease, clinical history, family history, eye exam, they will have you know, classic dark choroid shown here, but I don't get fluorescein angiograms very much anymore on these patients because autofluorescence works just as well uh, on this. I don't routinely get ERGs uh, because it's usually normal or only mildly affected and genetic testing is very useful on this. The problem is it's a very large gene so it's we still miss even though we know that uh, almost, essentially every patient with Stargardt disease will have a mutation in the ABCA4 gene they still miss them because of the large deletions it's, a, it's just a hard gene for them to sequence but I'd say they're missing only 20% of them now. So it's relatively, they're getting better at this. And we don't have time to go through the, the biochemistry in this, but it has to do with abnormal, the ABCA4 gene is important in moving all transretinal after bleaching out of the, out of the cell. And if it doesn't, if you, if you have all transretinal, if the all transretinal is there too long, it starts generating a whole series of toxic compounds that are fluorescent, and that's what you see when you see the increased fluorescence. Um, the way that you treat it is that we have patients avoid excessive vitamin A, avoid excessive sunlight. We are part of many different, uh, several different clinical trials that are looking at either vitamin A or visual cycle inhibitors, things that cause uh, vitamin A antagonists is another reason, the way that they're looking at that. We're also part of a trial looking at complement inhibitors and uh, how they may be uh, slowing down the disease. So there's, you'll see a number of clinical trials coming through. And they need genetic counseling, but you know, it's, it's a recessive disease. So again, if, they don't, if they're not marrying close relatives, the chances are one in 20 or one in 40, they'll find just a random carrier. Because there are lots of carriers out there. Um, 
dominant Stargardt disease is really rare, but I do have a family of about 18 uh, patients that I've been following here in, from California. It's a completely different mutation in ELOVL4. It's a completely different mechanism, but it can look just like Stargardt disease or pattern dystrophy. And I'll kind of skip through that. That'll be, that I sometimes give as a research talk. Other things that you'll see in macular dystrophies are best disease. That is dominant. Um, we don't know the exact incidence, and, but it's well known. It's a mutation in the VMD2 or best one disease uh, gene. And it has these classic uh, vitelliform lesions that, um, that can be associated with bestrophin mutations. And that you know, can progress, get these uh, scrambled egg or pseudo vitelliform lesions. They're loaded with lipofusin. And some patients do really well, and some patients do very poorly. It's just, and I've even seen such variable expressivity that I've seen one patient with full-blown best disease in one eye, and the other eye is totally normal as an adult. So it's just, it's, it's really kind of a bizarre disease. And the way that you, tr you do that, uh, the way that we assess that is clinical history, family history, autofluorescence, and then the classic things that you need to know is they'll have a, an abnormal electrooculogram and a normal ERG, classically, but there's always exceptions. And we do genetic testing for that, too. And I don't know, I don't know where gene therapy is right now. It's, I don't think it's, it's progressed enough to be anything important. Then finally, there's going to be the very rare diseases that I've never seen in my life, uh, but that are written up well. Soresby's fundus dystrophy. The reason why that comes up is it is a model for AMD some of the same mutations in the TIMP3 gene are also, can also cause macular degeneration. And typically they get these macular changes, they get choroidal neovascularization, which is unusual for a lot of these other dystrophies. And uh, that's found mainly in England. And then Malatia levantinese, also known as Doyne's honeycomb dystrophy, shows up on the boards. The main things you need to know is they've got these radial flecks here. And it's a well-known mutation and it is associated, it, some of the same genes can cause age-related macular degeneration. Again, that's too rare for you to ever see in my clinic. And then uh, North Carolina macular dystrophy is one other one that I'll just kind of, which I, it took me 20 years of practice before I finally found one, a patient with this. And the main things to know about this is it's dominant. They have horrible looking maculas but this is compatible with 20-20 vision. These patients have, can have really good vision, surprisingly. And it turns out this is actually congenital and non-progressive, even though it was only written. And it was the first macular dystrophy to have linkage, but it was the last one to have the gene identified. So that's, the, that's just kind of interesting with that. And there's no treatment yet. So that's it. Okay, so when you come to my, when you rotate with me, you know, I always encourage, as Chris was saying, you know, the, see the inherited retinal disease, you go in and see them first, really try to work them up and see what you, see what you can learn. Okay? All right. Very good.